good morning, party people, or as Surly Dev said, uh, good afternoon, party people. Surly Dev, I'm not sure what you mean about replay the intro. Tell me what you mean about replay the intro. I'm not sure if it was something that came directly from Twitch. Looks like the restream chat is frozen, too. Let me refresh that. Oh, dark, no, there it goes. Dark Dreamer says good morning. Howdy. Uh, so I am avoiding work. <laughs> it's Monday morning. It's about 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m. Oh, he says video of you driving. Oh, okay. I usually play those during the class breaks, like the training class breaks. That was that video thing was left over from uh, when I do the private training classes. I go off. It was the top of my head, yeah. I uh, go out uh, and do drives out in the Vegas desert, Iceland, you know, wherever it is that I go, uh, uh, Cabo driving around, um, and grab videos with a GoPro stuck to the top of the car or the iPhone and the windshield. And so I use those and uh, play them during class breaks, during training class breaks. Uh, so when we take a 15, 20 minute break during the master's classes, there's a video of you know me driving all over or wherever in the world. And then I talk to folks about uh, what it was in that particular location. So yeah, so I'm avoiding work. So I have a whole bunch of things I have to do, whether it's personal stuff, I need to organize the papers in my closet, I need to dust over here on my little memory wall type thing, I need to go out, I'm like, do anything I can. Ooh, see, I always wanted a drone. It's one of those things where I wanted really bad, especially when uh, we went to Iceland. But I was like, if I get a drone, then the vacation is going to become about the drone. Because I'm the kind of person who's like, okay, let me make sure I recharge the batteries, or right, let me get everything all set up, let me go fly through the thing. It's the same reason that I don't bring cameras on trips anymore. I used to bring like really nice digital cameras, and I would shoot stuff. I don't even do that anymore. Morning, CTI geek. Now, these days, I <laughs> just get one battery. These days, what I do is I'll go out on vacations and I'll take a couple of screen, a couple of pictures of my phone. But then when I come back, I will actually just go watch 4K YouTube drone videos because people get better shots on YouTube uh, than I'm going to get if I go through and do it all myself. And I'd have to focus on it. They get it in the perfect weather. They get it when no one else is around. And so it's like I get the best version of the memories just by surfing through other people's memories. And really, at the end of the day, do I really care? Uh, morning, Frag King. And I saw Jim Van Allen go by, too. At the end of the day, do I really care whether I shot the video or not? Not really. So I do feel differently about the driving stuff because it's my car. It's you know play, things that I couldn't capture any other way. And plus, I just stick the, the GoPro on the top of the car with a suction cup camera, and that's the end of it these days. Um, the, the one that they sell, the one that uh, GoPro sells for, for suction cups for cars, it works really well. I've been like 60, 70 miles an hour, and it doesn't even budge, so that's kind of cool. So I thought, well, hey, I'll just pop in and uh, go answer a few questions because there I've been really working hard at pruning out the questions at Polgab. I've been working really hard to uh, filter out the stuff that really doesn't need multi-line answers, and then I post those in blog posts. So then that way, uh, when it's time for us to get together, I have stuff that's actually really interesting. So the first one uh, from Ivan, what are the top signs that a table has a poor clustered index? And this is such an interesting question because I was like, oh, I've never thought of it that way, but I don't go looking for that problem. So the thing with bad clustered index design decisions is if it's bad enough to affect performance, it's usually because there isn't a clustered index because the data is literally organized in random order. And by the time that the database becomes large enough where the clustered index is a problem, it's also usually because people didn't do any non-clustered indexes. Think of the clustered index as like a backup. That's the place where all of the data lives is like a really long term. But think of non-clustered indexes as the reporting copies. You want to design the right non-clustered indexes so that most queries can get what they need by darting in and out of that. Because after all, there's only two ways that you're going to hit the clustered index. You're either going to dive bomb in looking for directly the row that you want, in which case you accessed it via a non-clustered index and you know the keys. In that case, it doesn't really matter how atrocious the keys are. You already know the one row that you're diving into. Or you're scanning it. And if you're going to scan the clustered index, I'll be honest with you, 
you're not going to be happy with performance, and it doesn't really matter how the data is organized anyway. You're going to read every single row. Now, there are people who think that fragmentation is a big problem, and then they'll, I'll uh, encourage them to go watch if you Google for Brento's R fragmentation and then kind of reset expectations around whether or not that's really a problem for you. But it's a really interesting question, and I, it, just because of, there's only two ways you access the clustered index, diving in for one row or scanning the whole thing, that helps reset people's expectation. They're thought, oh, I thought putting it in a different order would help. Not if you're reading every row. If you're reading every row, you're kind of screwed. Hey, Netherlands in the house. How do you search? Next up, uh, not close enough to retirements to stop learning asks, Hi Brent, it seems that the job market uh, is paying for more for gen data generalists uh, than specialists. I disagree. So here's where I think that you're getting that from. I think that you're getting that from ads. If you go look at recruitment ads, let me tell you what happens. There's a frustrated data person somewhere, and they've spread themselves thin for so long. They've been working at this company, and they're like, you want to use Python? Okay. You want me to manage load MySQL? Okay, I guess I will. You're using MongoDB? Oh, God, please. And the next thing you know, they're just totally burned out. They're stressed out. And all they're going to do is go quit and go work somewhere else. And then the company goes, well, I guess we're going to need to uh, hire their replacement. And then they make a list of everything that that person was doing. And it's like this big giant almanac. Must know MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, the, the, the SAP APIs, uh, back office. You know, they just make this j ridiculous big long list of technologies. And at first, they can't hire anybody for the same price that they were paying that last employee for. So they gradually turn up the salary dial, and they try to advertise it in more places. We can't find anybody. Guess we just don't have a good network. We'll try recruiters. And the next thing you know, recruiters are advertising this position of must know baby seals, giraffes, you know, just ridiculous lists of things. So the, the position that you're applying for, the reason that they want so much money is that person doesn't exist. And if you took that job, you'd be stressed out as all hell. So don't go by recruiters as this is what that, that's absolutely true. And companies don't know how to prioritize things. Companies are kind of like, well, if they know any of these things, we'll be able to run with it. Now, we as data people, we look at that list and we think it's an and when in reality, it's often an or so. Uh, yeah, I saw you. I use lowercase for select stopped in. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Uh, next up, we have Genity says, uh, when should you use a table per year of data structure? This is called uh, t uh, partitioned views uh, versus using formal table partitioning. The thing that I love uh, partitioned views for is let's say that we got a data warehouse with 10 years worth of history and someone wants to add a column to that fact table. Well, if you've got 10 years worth of history and you want to add a column with partitioned views, it's very easy because that column didn't exist in the past. You simply edit the view. And I'm going to give you an example in pseudocode. So over in SQL Server Management Studio, I'm going to go pop open a new query, and we're going to act as if we're designing our fact table here. I'm going to say create table DBO sales, and I'm going to put in there, we'll say uh, sale date, date time. And this isn't going to be a great table. It's just going to show us an example. Uh, product ID int, uh, quantity sold, <sighs> decimal. Uh, 182. I'm making this up as I go. Uh, and then cost or price, we'll say price each uh, decimal 182. Okay, so if you're using regular table partitioning and you want to add a column, you have to alter it. And that's especially dangerous if you want to backport a default value and start filling it in. You can add a default value that's just a, a default, and then SQL Server doesn't go rewrite the 8K data pages. But a lot of people don't do that correctly. Well, if you have a couple of tables, so let's say sales 2022, and then we'll also say copy and then paste. We'll also say 2021 um, and go. 
So I have these two tables now, and I'm going to alter them together using a partitioned view. And I'm going to do a really crappy job of it, just, so, just to see real quickly. Create or alter view DBO sales as select sale date product ID quantity sold and price each, just so you can see their price each, from DBO Sales 2022, Union All, come down, Union, Union All, <laughs> and then we'll do the exact same thing from 2021, copy, paste, and go. Okay, so this is usually what people think of as partition views. It is an extremely simplified version, but just in order to tell the story. Now, we're going to, because this year we've got a new initiative, and we're going to say we're also going to add in salesperson ID int. Now, we're going to add that into the existing 2022 table. I can't backport it into 2021 because I don't know who the salesperson was at that time. We just weren't uh, creating that data. Well, the way that you do it is that then you can add in salesperson ID in the 2022 version of the table. But then for the old one, you just say null as salesperson ID. And you don't have to change the table structure. All you're doing is adding columns to the view. If you wanted to add calculations, you could add that as well. So what's cool about this then is on the 2021 data, that can be on read-only storage. For your archival data, what some shops will do is they'll put it into a beautifully done column store index because it's not getting frequent inserts, updates, and deletes. This is a really slick way to go through and modify old data without having to actually modify it. When I explain this concept to people when we're you know, like talking through data warehouse design, I'll say, okay, does this ring a bell with you that you've had to add columns to tables in the past? And companies will either say yes or no, like, no, this table's been mature for 10 years and we're not changing anything. Or they go, oh, yeah, we've been constantly trying to add new columns. Then that's how you decide that you want a partitioned view. All right. So coming, that's that one. Uh, can, uh, coming up next, uh, let's see, we have Mr. Ed. <laughs> Mr. Ed says, how would I determine if my IT team needs a DBA? We have several people sort of filling in parts of this role. Is there some metric I can justify to the business? I wouldn't go based on number of uh, database servers or database size or whatever. I'd ask, what is it that the business wants to do that they can't do? And for me, one of those is high availability and disaster recovery. Go ahead and do a, 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 an imaginary failover to another data center. List out everything that you would have to do. Or d pretend that you just dropped a table in production and list out everything. Oh, make sure to read the, the thing up there about how to ask questions here. Um, so, uh, pretend that you just dropped a table and then you got to go restore its contents. Write out everything that you would do and how long it would take and then present that to the business so that the business understands how long an outage would be or uh, how much work would be involved with the failover. That's often the gatekeeper where people go, well, what do you mean we can't fail over immediately? Or what do you mean we'd be down for a day and a half? And then you can say, the team that I have right now is already completely stretched to the max, like we have no spare hours, and building out high availability or disaster recovery is something that we don't do, we don't know how to do, and we need net new time in order to accomplish that. Depending on what those projects look like, maybe it's bringing in a consultant. This certainly is not a sales pitch for me because I don't build high availability and disaster recovery anymore. Um, but it, that's the kind of thing that would make you choose to either hire a consultant or bring in a full-time employee, ask the business what they want to do. And sometimes you have to just present a menu to them too as well. Uh, let's see here. Tom says, can you recommend a live T-SQL class? Tom? Tom. Tom, have you ever been to brentozar.com? If you've never been to brentozar.com, hop on over there. 
and around the top there are several words in large print. One of them happens to say training, as in, I would like to hit you with a train. That is how I make my living, not hitting people with trains, although I suppose to some extent I do that as well. Uh, but you could go to brentozar.com, click training, and it just so happens that I don't recommend those classes at all. They're terrible. Absolutely awful. And then finally, the last one that's in the queue, Richie asked, uh, and this is, so Richie's my developer, and we were doing testing on Polegab, and he asked, if you were a woodchuck, would you prefer brick and mortar structures? And I was like, oh, I don't think I know anything about woodchucks. And so I opened up Wikipedia, and I was like completely amazed at everything that there is to know about woodchucks. I'm going to like zoom it in and just to see. Um, so first off, of course, they, they look absolutely adorable. I didn't know that they were exactly the same as groundhogs. I mean, you know, you hear Groundhog Day. And I didn't know that that was the same as a woodchuck. Uh, me, the being ever the city dweller. Look at the list of nicknames that he has. Thickwood Badger, Whistle Pig, Weenisk. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. This is such a cool guy. Uh, and there's so many things that are interesting around this. They communicate threats through whistling and work cooperatively to solve tasks such as burrowing. There's so many interesting things inside here about it. You know, their, their territory, of course, this is why I don't know much about woodchucks as I haven't lived around uh, near where woodchucks are in a while. They're so adorable. And then there, the section on relationship with humans I was like, this is this is absolutely really cool. There's so much going on inside there. Groundhogs are okay. This what this part I wasn't thrilled about. Groundhogs are used in medical research on hepatitis B induced liver count cancer. I was like, uh, a percentage of the woodchuck population is infected with it. Okay, all right, the poor guys. But no, it was such an interesting post. So then I will leave you with that because I found that uh, incredibly interesting. <laughs> Who knows if I'm uh, uh, alone in that one, but I thought that was really incredible. Um, let's see here. JP says, why should I learn no SQL if I know SQL? Is it only because of the speed? Part of it is licensing costs. So SQL Server at $2,000 a core US for standard edition, $7,000 a core for enterprise edition. Generally, I tell people that uh, relational databases should be kind of your last resort. If you don't join things, don't put them in an expensive database. Because even if you go with MySQL or Postgres, they have management overhead. They're not exactly easy to administer. Some of the NoSQL solutions out there are designed beautifully to pass in a, a key and then get back a value. As long as you're not doing joins between them, they're fairly easy to administer, fast, inexpensive. Uh, there's a lot to say about those. Now, is if you're doing your work as a data professional, you may not want to learn those tools because there's less administration involved. It's not zero administration, but like if I have clients who are thinking about doing NoSQL stuff, I'm like, just go buy a managed solution. Go put your stuff in like Amazon DynamoDB, uh, where uh, Amazon manages it for you. There are things that developers have to learn, uh, like how you get the data in and out as quickly as possible, how you key the data. But as a database professional, like I I don't have to know anything about it. Amazon manages all the backup and stuff like that. Uh, oh, there are a couple more questions that have come in here. Let's see here. Uh, Vinny says, I'm trying to export a Firebird table. I only work on the Microsoft data platform. You know, it's funny. I say like Amazon DynamoDB or I, I work with Amazon tools a lot, but I don't do anything with Firebird at all. Um, the the th Trying to export to another thing with DBeaver. You got, totally got me on there. Sorry. And then Rob says, we have a 4.8 terabyte share uh, RMP database causing lots of issues like backups due to the size. Can't figure out how to trim the data. The question to ask uh, end users is, is it okay if we delete files out of the SharePoint database? And then there are like third-party utilities that you can go through and delete old articles or uploads that people have done. I don't have experience anymore on which one's the best. A long time ago, like 10 years ago, I worked for Quest Software, and they had a tool where you could, spec you could specify retention policies, and like delete everything older than three years, for example. What I will say is, even if you deleted half the history, you're still going to have problems. What you want to do when the database exceeds one terabyte in size is switch to snapshot backups. 
So uh, check with your storage provider, wherever the databases live, and see if they can do SQL Server snapshot backups. Now, most SAN vendors can. It's a technology that's been out for like 15 years now. Uh, works really well, uh, backs up databases of any size in a matter of seconds. You still have to offload it off the SAN uh, if you want to like replicate it somewhere else or, or archive it to another appliance. Uh, but that's the technology that you want to start looking for. All right, so I am going to now be forced. No, the timing is actually really good. It's uh, 53 minutes after the hour, so now I have... Um, my local coffee shop is opening up, so now I get to go figure out which car I want to take. It's not raining today, and we rained the last two days in Vegas, and uh, it means I can have less choices about which cars I want to take out. Uh, so I've been meaning to take out my little Porsche Speedster and uh, run that down to the coffee shop. So I'll go down to the coffee shop and uh, uh, go uh, waste some more time before I get back in and have to start working eventually. So thanks for hanging out with me this morning, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.